Okay. Uh, good morning and welcome to the 2021 Oregon Active Transportation Summit. My name is Maddie Carlson. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the Engagement and Events Assistant with the Street Trust. Before we begin our program, the Street Trust would like to acknowledge the land we are occupying. The Portland metro area rests on traditional village sites of the Multnomah, Wasco, Cowlitz, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Bands of Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapuya, Malala, and many other tribes who made their homes along the Columbia River. We take this opportunity to thank the original caretakers of this land. Thank you. Welcome to Safe Routes to Parks, Actionable Steps Towards Equitable and Safe Access to Everyday Destinations. Your presenters for this session are Natasha Riveron and Becky Gilliam. You can type your questions in the chat or use the raise hand tool, both found at the bottom of your screen. Please use the social media hashtag OATS21 to post about the summit on social media. And don't forget to visit our website at thestreettrust.org to learn more about our other programs and activities, including SB 395, AKA Safe Routes for All, an update to the historic bike bill on its 50th anniversary that the Street Trust is championing in the Oregon legislature this session. To claim AICP credit for attending this session, uh, please log into the OATS Sketch platform and find the AICP certificate download link near the top of the page. Now, without further delay, please welcome to your screen, Natasha Riveron. Hello. Thank you, Maddie, for that introduction and for all of that information. Uh, I am really happy to be here today. Uh, just to give you a sense of where we're going with today's presentation, we're going to do some intros. We're going to talk about what Safe Routes the Parks is as a movement, as well as introduce a new Oregon specific toolkit, which we're really excited to have live on the internet for you guys. And then we're going to do a deep dive into some specific topics that we cover within the toolkit. And I really appreciate folks who took the time to indicate what they would like to hear about today. I took that feedback and incorporated it into this presentation. And so we're gonna be looking specifically at connecting safe routes to parks and safe routes to school, as well as working with unhoused communities in parks. We're also gonna be including a little bit of ideas for incorporating funding with those specific topics. So it's a little bit broader than just those two. As a way of introduction, uh, I have my colleague Becky here, as well as myself. Um, we are from Safe Routes Partnership, which was formerly known as Safe Routes to School National Partnership. It is a national nonprofit organization that's working to advance safe walking and rolling to and from schools and in everyday life. And we do that with the goal of improving health and well being of people of all races, income levels, and abilities, and building healthy, thriving communities for everyone. Uh, I am the Healthy Parks and Places Manager. My contact information is right here. I run our Safe Routes to Parks program. And Becky, who's on the line, I'd love for you to hop on and give a little intro. Sure, thanks, Natasha. Hello, everyone, uh, Becky Gilliam. I'm a program support manager with the Safe Routes Partnership. I've been with the partnership for just over three years and until recently was working as a policy manager in the Salem-Kaiser area. Um, I'm still based out of Silverton, Oregon. Great to see some familiar uh, names here today. I'm mostly here to provide some support to Natasha and help answer any questions I can about our toolkit and Safe Routes to Parks. Thank you. Yeah, and what's particularly helpful is Becky is located in Oregon. I don't know if you just mentioned that. Um, currently, I'm in New Haven, Connecticut, but we'll be moving out to Seattle, uh, very close to all of you soon, this summer actually. So hi, everybody. Um, I see a lot of your names, but I'd love to know where you're zooming in from and your favorite place to walk your bike. Um, this is a picture of me and I'm smiling, I swear. You just can't see it. Uh, this is in front of a dam that's near my house. It's a really beautiful park and I love walking there after work. So yeah, I'd love to see your name, um, maybe what your role is and like why you're here today and favorite place to walk and bike. Uh, 
I'll give you just a minute to put it in the chat box. Okay, Waterfront Park downtown. Pilot Butte, awesome. We like water around here. Ah, oh, the beaches, you are all so lucky. You're Forest Park in Portland, Forest Park again. Oh, Forest Park is fun. East Bank Esplanade and the Willamette Riverfront Pass. Willamette, I might've said that wrong. Willamette, you got it right. Willamette, nice, okay, perfect. Great, well, thank you. Um, and I asked this question, not just like for a fun intro, but because I think coming back to like why we love outdoor spaces or why we love getting to these like localized green and like natural spaces does connect to why this work is so important. Um, that feeling of healthy and fun and just like relaxing time is so important. So Safe Rocks to Parks, it's a movement to make great parks safer and easier to access by walking, bicycling, and taking public transportation. So we particularly focus on low-income communities and communities of color, where we know that less investment has gone into the routes and to the amenities in parks. And we do this because safe places to walk, bike, and connect with nature directly contribute to the physical, mental, and social well-being of the population and ourselves. And we know that just from our own experiences, but there's lots of research on that as well. Um, especially after this year, I feel like we have all gained a renewed appreciation for these outdoor spaces that are closer to home. And so the Safe Rats to Parks initiative was originally developed through a grant from the CDC to the National Recreation and Parks Association, or NRPA. And I'll probably mention NRPA again, um, but so it's the Recreation and Parks Association. And that was to support the Surgeon General's call to action on walking and walkability. And so NRPA invited us along with the Trust for Public Land to create the Safe Routes to Parks Action Framework, which is basically this um, diagram you can see here. And it serves as a guide for advocates to work through the process of assessing park access, planning those improvements, implementing the change, and then sustaining that work. And as you can see, engagement is at the center of that process. Community members are essential to the process of project selection, design, uh, implementation, and that's because they're the local experts on their neighborhoods. And partnering with community leadership acknowledges that wisdom and the assets that communities hold, and that can be the first step toward rectifying past and ongoing injustices that are built into our communities by racist and um, yeah, racist land use and capital investment policies and practices. Uh, these decisions and policies have led to poor health outcomes, um, less access to safe and high quality parks and public spaces, decreased physical activity, and then higher rates of traffic related injuries and fatalities. Um, collectively, we have the opportunity and responsibility to create conditions that enable everyone to build on their community strengths and to ensure high quality community assets are accessible and safe for people, regardless of age, ability, or disability. And I assume that a lot of you are familiar with the Smart Growth America's Dangerous by Design, but um, I can also drop a link as a resource. This is always a really good resource. So Safe Apps to Parks provides a host of benefits, which includes the following, um, increasing equitable access, for people regardless of race, ethnicity, age, or ability, increasing opportunities for physical activity, um, improving safety from traffic and personal violence, a decrease in the environment imp environmental impact of daily travel, and strengthening community connections. And we're really excited to announce that we have a new Oregon-specific toolkit with resources developed to help parks and rec agencies, as well as other safe routes to parks advocates support local level change. And this is entirely um, based on 
having community partnerships really guide this work. And the majority of the tools can be useful and understandable regardless of whether you are a parks and rec um, person professionally. And so the guide, as this is just kind of a screenshot of this new guide, it walks you through the process that we use to advance safe routes to parks. And so we do a lot of technical assistance on this work. And so we've taken all of that knowledge and sort of put it into this. Um, and we have each of the five sections uh, correspond to the different steps in the framework, which is on the left. And each one includes reflection questions, like a list of steps to take, as well as specific resources to guide the application. And throughout the toolkit, we've included stories of success from Oregon as well as across the country. Um, specific tools that you can take and use, like tables, uh, meeting agendas, uh, ideas for uh, creative engagement, action planning, surveys. Like, we really want this to be like, something you can grab and go with. And additionally, there's over 20 ideas for funding sources, as well as ideas for creatively using existing funding for this work. And Becky, I think, is going to drop it in the chat box. And I think she just did. Amazing. Thanks, Becky. And we also want to uh, give a quick plug is that we will be having a webinar that dives more specifically into this toolkit um, coming up. And she just dropped the registration link in the chat box. Awesome. Okay, so that's Safe Routes to Parks and the new Oregon specific toolkit. I will pause here if anybody has specific questions about Safe Routes to Parks or the toolkit, because then we're going to do a deep dive. And so feel free, you can put it in the chat box if you have a question, or you can raise your hand, although I don't know if I can see that. Um, I can see it. Uh, Natasha, while we're waiting, if any questions come in, I can just share quickly a little more about um, what to what to expect on the May 20th webinar. If you want to learn more about this toolkit, we're going to do a deep dive, as Natasha has mentioned. Um, we'll also have other panelists from Oregon State University Extension Service, Oregon Recreation Park Association, as well as Tualatin Hills Park and Recreation District. I will be joining that panel as well. So hope that you'll join us and um, also check out the link to the new toolkit um, that's in the chat as well. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, so then we will move on to our first deep dive, which is connecting Safe Routes to Parks and Safe Routes to School. Let's go. Okay, so I'm really excited to share really specific ideas for connecting these two movements. And I do wanna say that this is certainly not exhaustive. I feel like I could write a lot more and spend a lot more time talking about this. Um, so these are just some ideas to get your mind going. Additionally, I think if you aren't necessarily connected to Safe Routes to School or if, if, it, if that isn't necessarily your area, I think this will still be really useful because these can be applied with different partners. And this partnership between Parks and Rec and Safe Routes to School and other active transportation folks, like this is a partnership that's very, very useful. And so even if you aren't one of like the main partners, I think helping cultivate that would be really useful. And so before we get started, I'm curious, are safe routes to school and parks and recreation working together in your community? And do you see opportunities? If so, I'd love for you to drop it in the chat box. And I do want to give a shout out to Leah, who's on this call, Leah Beato um, Luis, who I had the opportunity to chat with about this topic. And so a lot of her examples are actually in here. Um, so shout out to you, Leah. Yeah, and I know a lot of you were interested in this topic. So I, if you have like initial thoughts, questions, drop them in the chat. And we'll also have time to, for questions and discussion after this section as well, if you guys are needing some time to warm up.
Okay. I would love to hear from all of you afterward. Or if you're doing something similar to the examples that I'm sharing, please do drop it in the chat because I'd love to hear from you. So why are we even discussing this? I think the names themselves are so close that it almost feels like too obvious that they should go together. But I also understand when Parks and Rec folks or Safe Rock to School folks feel like going outside of their specific area to like include parks or to include schoolwork, like it's out of their um, sort of their wheelhouse. And so what I'm going to do is like just outline how I see them sort of overlapping and then really specific ways that this alignment can help both initiatives go further than they could on their own. And then Paul says, huge opportunities for Portland. Too many schools and parks without adequate infrastructure. Yes, opportunities abound. So why work together? Broadly, Safe Routes to Parks and Safe Routes to School share a really core constituency, which is kids and their families. Both programs really should be actively seeking to better understand the experiences of this population and provide the programs and advocacy to help do the things listed on the slide to the left, which are very similar to what I mentioned for Safe Routes to Park, um, but also increasing the efficiency with which we use time, whether that's staff time, volunteer time, as well as funding. I'm sure many of you are pretty familiar with the six E's of Safe Routes to School, which outline components of a comprehensive and integrated approach. And so here are the six E's. And so just to introduce it along with the Safe Routes to Parks Action Framework, which outlines a process to work through improvements. Uh, this really is the process to work through for improving parks and the routes to access them. And then the six E's are more about outlining the programmatic content of Safe Routes to School programs. And so I see these two tools as a great entry point to understand how these two efforts align. Notice that engagement is front and center for both, and also equity should shape both of these processes. I'll often um, put like a box around the Safe Routes to Parks action framework in order to be like, everything is through an equity lens. Uh, Additionally, evaluation in the six E's uh, corresponds with assessment, and then planning and implementation in Safe Routes to Parks is um, where the planning and implementation of engineering, education, and encouragement from the six E's can take place. And I think another thing to really underline as well is that these aren't necessarily steps, like this is steps in the process in a way, but it's an iterative thing. Like these, you're never going to reach an end point. I mean, we all have this kind of far off goal, um, but this really is a, a cycle. And Natasha, um, it looks like a couple of folks did respond to ideas for aligning safe oh, routes awesome. to parks and safe routes to school. Leah had shared that they are working with Parks and Rec on park and walk sites for their elementary schools. Um, Robert had shared, um, always wish schoolyards weren't fenced off to the community. There's lots of places in my neighborhood where parks and schoolyards touch each other but are divided by a fence, keeping park users from being able to walk through the block to the street on the other side. Um, and then Rob in Eugene says, it's not necessarily intentional, but lots of our Safe Routes to School infrastructure projects also create Safe Routes to Parks. So a couple of ideas coming That's in. Awesome. Um, and I'll also flag that it looks like uh, Paul has their hand raised and maybe it's a, a question pertinent to what you're chatting about right now. Yeah, Paul, if you wanna come off mute, you are welcome to. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm just curious what the, uh, why does an engineering have a more primary role in Safe Routes to School when we know that the primary contributors to uh, injury are speed um, and, and, you know, motor, motor vehicle speed and we don't, why, why does an engineering play more of a primary role in designing streets that are safer and slower as opposed to rely pretty much like 
putting it on the victims of traffic violence, in this case, children, to uh, be the be their own champions, as opposed to creating like having engineering be like more primary, especially like in the I'd say in the post in the in the current era post COVID, when you know we're we're needing to have a lot more shared space on roads and um, you know the the outcome of it is is going to come out very different from what safe routes to school and all these programs looked like in the pre-COVID era. Um, so are you asking specifically, just to repeat your question back to you, um, why engineering doesn't take a leading role in safe routes to school or did you mean safe routes to park? In, in either, in both. Um, so I would say that it, I am curious about why you would say that it doesn't take a leading role. I think there's a lot well, of different uh, approaches. If I, if I can clarify, just because you, you said that yeah. engagement is the leading approach in both. Um, yeah, oh, so why is engineering not the leading approach? Correct, yeah. Right, um, yeah, so what we, will say is that and like engineering is a tool but it's not like it's a tool but not necessarily like the guiding principle like engaging and understanding what folks in a community are experiencing the barriers and assets that they have like we have to understand the community before we do anything to change the physical environment um because like a tool used you know, like I think we can like narrow streets, but we don't know what how folks are feeling. And I think leading with engagement is always the way that we recommend going. And Natasha, if I can add, you know, we we yeah. uh, definitely have our six E's framework that we um, recommend for you know robust and comprehensive safe routes to school and safe routes to parks programs so certainly engineering does play a big role in that but we lead with engagement and center equity with within each e um as natasha said so that we're we're sure that practitioners are are really listening to students families teachers and school leaders folks that are working with an existing community to um, move that program structure forward Cool. I, I hope that that addressed your question. Um, I'm going to move forward so we can get through these. And also feel free to drop more thing, questions in the chat box. OK, so for engagement, uh, one really great example of combining engagement efforts for Safe Reps to School and Safe Reps to Park happened in Tucson, Arizona, where the Transportation and Mobility Department partnered with Living Streets Alliance, which is a nonprofit. Um, they did this really cool movie night with ice cream and free bike maintenance and opportunities to share input on a proposed bicycle boulevard, which connected several parks, schools, and a library. And so LSA has been working on Safe Routes to School and Complete Streets initiatives in Tucson for a while and generally engaging community and kind of just like asking people to articulate their vision but this partnership with the city gave them a closer relationship to the city to kind of move those um, that feedback up through the ranks. But it also gave the city an opportunity to try something new and like a more meaningful and authentic way to engage with people in a low risk way um, and model ways that they could do that in the future and sort of incorporate it into their timeline. Collaborating like this is really great because community members' experiences are rarely ever like in boxes, like this is my park experience, this is my experience of getting to school. Like everybody sort of experiences their life like as one big whole. So it's helpful to ask people about it in that way as well. Um, consider using joint listening sessions with kids and families and um, inviting local youth to share their stories and to open the conversation in a way that feels engaging and meaningful and relevant to them. And prioritizing equity. So prioritizing resources to increase equity 
is really important here in this partnership because transportation, public health, and parks and recs folks, they have all of these different sources of funding that they're familiar with. They're kind of within their silo and coordinating to prioritize projects and funding based on the data that you're all collecting and the information that you're getting can lead to stronger, more effective use of that funding. Um, prioritizing in prioritizing neighborhoods or streets or other areas based on qualitative data like um, crash data, safety data is great, but um, perceptions of safe park access and school access can be really different based on race, gender, sexual orientation, and like a whole host of other factors. So um, listening to members of the community, again, leading with engagement to ask what their experiences are can give you a really robust um, idea of how to prioritize things in addition to the data. Additionally, um, opening school grounds for community use. I know somebody mentioned that in the chat box. Um, this is um, a concept called shared use or joint use. And basically it's opening up uh, facilities to community use. So opening up say a playground for to become a community park, especially in areas where there may not be lots of park access. That's a great way to um, sort of increase park access and then also share resources to maintain that space. Um, and I may say this wrong, Tualatin in Tualatin, Oregon, I know that the Parks and Rec Department has a shared use agreement with the school district and they um, it specifically shared investment in two school facilities and the facilities include like a sports field and a cross country running trail. And that ensures the public and student access to these really high quality outdoor assets. And then education, um, this is where I have my shout out to Leah. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with traffic gardens or miniature child size roadways. I love that they can be really complex and professional grade or simple constructions made with chalk and paint and duct tape. And it's great because you can just use an unused flat surface, um, whether that's a just a lot or an old tennis court. In Beaverton, Oregon, the Safe Routes to School coordination team includes representatives of Parks and Rec and the city and county departments. And the team meets often to discuss projects and coordinate. And this allows for coordination that's like a lot more robust and responsive. And so they work together to install a temporary pop-up traffic garden on a basketball play pad. And Leah, um, the Safe Routes School Coordinator, presented the idea to the coordination team in June 2020. And so she shared these photos of similar concepts in Portland and explained the rationale. And then the Parks and Recreation Department followed up the next week to offer potential locations. And so this was one of um, the locations. And the last time I talked to her, they were coordinating a plan for permanent installation in 2021. Um, and I don't know if Leah has an update, but feel free to share that if you do. But sure. I think this is a great opportunity. I could go ahead, Leah. Yeah, so um, we are still talking about a permanent installation. Right now, I think they, the Parks Department wants a more robust pilot program, so we're looking at piloting another temporary traffic garden, but combining um, just a more detailed study of like what successes are going to look like and some measurements, um, but, but we are still working together on that. Awesome. Thanks, Leah. And I will flag a really great resource from Oregon Metro on um, traffic playgrounds, or which are like traffic gardens. There's multiple names for them, um, and we can definitely share that. So encouragement, um, highlighting the connections between schools and parks. Uh, this picture on the right is from Merced County, California, and a nonprofit, Cultiva La Salud, uh, focused on creating healthy and equitable connections between parks and schools. And they worked with the schools, with residents in the town, the United Way, uh, and they basically created this decorated path between the park and the elementary school. And so they worked together to paint this art on the sidewalk and installed these educational signs in both English and Spanish so that there were these fun little activities to do as you went between the two locations. And 
what's really fun about this is like this connects it visually but also like mentally like you're doing these activities together between these two spaces and um yeah i think what's great is you can sort of expand this connection programmatically as well so finding ways to get kids to bike or walk together to the park or finding ways to do science class field trips to like the local park right near your school and like make that connection in a way that's fun and sort of build this idea of the park as a place for them um, into school. Engineering. Um, this is a photo from Honolulu, Hawaii from one of our safe routes to parks grantees. And what's really great, this is a um, great example of like an engineering uh, kind of pilot project that then expanded. Basically, they painted these bulb outs on a street corner as which are like corner extensions that encourage folks to drive slower as they turn. And they did this near a park to slow traffic because there had been a lot of um, traffic fatalities in that area. And their success um, was noticed by the town, uh, the council, the city council. And so with the community's involvement and, um, in, and like building interest with this one project, they ended up doing another application and they won a 320,000 infrastructure grant to organize the same kind of community-led process to install art to slow traffic in association with safe routes to schools. So this actually started as like a park safety project and then expanded into safe routes to school. Again, I think the coordination is super important in coordinating potential projects that support both park and school goals to increase equity and safety is so important. And Parks improvement projects are often planned years in advance and in master planning documents and other park or trail systems specific plans. And like, that's the same thing with transportation, um, but getting into those plans early is essential. So I really recommend reviewing these documents and opportunities for alignment. And that's something that's in the Oregon specific toolkit as well. We've kind of pointed out specific policies to look at and what to look for. And then evaluation, um, you're collecting similar data, like safe routes to school folks and safe routes to parks folks. They wanna know about traffic fatalities. They wanna know about like, um, they wanna do walk on it. How do you feel walking from X to Y? Um, working together to collect that data just saves you time. Additionally, I think asking folks how they want to see this partnership um, bloom and like what they want to see come from it is super essential as well so working with youth families community members uh, school staff parks and rec folks uh, identify like what successful connectivity between schools parks homes and other community destinations looks like and then work backward from that big vision to identify potential ways to measure progress so like think about how many um, students are participating in park and walk programs or like self-reported feelings of safety in the park or on the trails that connect parks to schools. Um, how many school events happen at the park? So those are just some ideas for thinking about measuring success. And so I know I just ran through that pretty quickly. Um, if you have questions, drop them in. I'm going to pause and look at the chat box now. And also, are there any ideas that are like, ooh, that's interesting. I'd love to hear more about that. Because um, we can definitely collect the resources and sort of point you in the right direction to learn more. I'm gonna take a pause. I'm gonna drink some water as I do that. Yeah, and as we're waiting for any questions or ideas folks wanna share, um, a couple of chats that came in, one from Kim, so this is around our um, quick engineering discussion. Kim just noted engineering is a very expensive E. The other E's are more affordable. So good point that that maybe is more approachable for some folks. Um, and then Megan also shared that school fences are barriers to mobility for children in Hood River for fear of school shootings. Um, they also said this would be a great topic for the partnership to debunk. So thanks, Megan. Um, definitely taking note of that. Yeah, noted. 
Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I'm like so pro connecting schools to green spaces that are right nearby. Um, so thank you so much. Engineering is the most effective e in creating safety. Yeah, expensive, effective. And again, Pilot Butte State Park, it, yeah, with um, gates. Hmm. Yeah, and these specific things are so helpful too, because then we can think and like investigate why, like what are approaches that can sort of address these issues. Cool. Okay, so that's Safe Routes to School. And like that's sort of a taste of some ideas that are in this toolkit. There's more in there. So definitely go look at it. Um, and yeah, because I didn't want to like just run through the whole toolkit with you. Oh, wow. That's another question. Okay, I'll read it out loud. Um, in city government context, if planning staff are interested in advancing safe routes through both capital improvement projects and development slash frontage street improvement, but engineering, operations, public works, staff aren't, what to do? Okay, sorry, I have to read that again. Um, engineering, operations, public works, staff aren't, what to do? Um, that's a great question. Uh, my initial answer, and Becky, please weigh in, is you wanna just like, build excitement from the top like i'm assuming that um public work staff like i mean they have a lot to do they have a lot on their plate but when something comes from the top from um agency leadership or elected officials like that's when stuff gets done um, and when there's public will so building excitement both from like the grassroots and grass tops yeah, and I'll also add, Natasha, that and another plug for our toolkit that we just released is we do have a new resource in there, one that talks a little bit more about different roles that um, your partners can play in Safe Routes to Parks, and that includes um, operations, engineering, and public work staff. And we also include some like talking points and ideas for sort of aligning priorities and helping to identify how Safe Routes to Parks helps to achieve shared goals. So I recommend checking out our engagement section of the toolkit there. Um, and then Natasha, I see Leah has her hand raised as well. Yeah, yeah go ahead, Leah. My question is more about um, measuring success. Um, and, and maybe you mentioned, is there a section in the toolkit that addresses that. I know you you mentioned briefly a few different ways of measuring success of a project. I just, I can't quite wrap my head. You know, you can't sit there and count the number of users, <laughs> right, at a park. Um, so I'm just trying to think of alternate ways to measure success of, of kind of like a pilot program or, or something that you have done uh, with the parks. Definitely. So these were so these suggestions were really specific to safe routes to park and safe routes to school like as, like how's the partnership going but we do have a full section on data collection both quantitative and qualitative so like like more squishy things versus like literally counting and there's actually approaches to literally counting people in parks but it's um a much more manageable thing so like finding a location and then like timing it based on day um, but Leah, I'm so happy to follow up on that to like give you the specific section and the specific resources for that. Awesome. Yeah, it is in there. <laughs> Thanks. Cool. Okay. Can you share thoughts on funding sources slash opportunities you come across for implementation? So Nathan, that's, um, oh my gosh, I wish I could dive into that and I could feel like I could give a whole presentation on this. Um, we have a full um, section of it, of the resource, fully dedicated to specific Safe Routes to Parks implementation funding and using existing funding sources creatively and through partnerships um, with example. So I would um, kind of push you towards that resource. And if you have questions about it, reach out to me. My email is on this um, 
slideshow. And I'm assuming we will kind of address that a little bit in the webinar as well, Becky. Yes, absolutely. And I'll I'll drop a note in the chat as well, Nathan, of where you can look in the toolkit for ideas there. Perfect. Okay. With that, I'm so glad you guys are throwing stuff in the chat. I love hearing specific examples and opportunities and barriers. Um, but I'm gonna jump to the next section, which is about unhoused communities. And um, I know that this is often really popular, so I want to make sure I get to it. Um, we will have time for questions at the end. So I'm just going to get to this and then, yeah, I'd love to hear what you guys think. So far and away, like whenever we chat about this, people get really excited to talk about this because it's something that is tricky. Um, and so I guess if you want to drop in the chat, like, is this manifesting in your community? Like, having folks living in parks, living um, um, like in public spaces and like a sense of safety issues and transportation. Like I know that this is happening across the country and in Oregon. Um, so please drop that in the chat and I'm gonna start kind of chatting about how we think about this, but we can definitely stop to address your notes. So, when we're thinking about this, and Becky and I have been talking about this a lot, like what is our lane with this? Um, there are so many people working on the complex issue of unhoused communities and parks. And we think it's really essential to start with where our expertise lies. Um, we're professionals committed to connecting people safely to community destinations. And that includes people who are unhoused and safety, belonging, we want people to be supported by public goods. And that's how we've been thinking about this issue and our part in it. So Safe Routes to Parks is about increasing park usage and improving health for people of all ages, races, abilities, disabilities, and income levels. And so as a concept, it doesn't discriminate against unhoused people. But we do understand that in communities, the presence associated with um, the presence and the challenges that come with um, unhoused folks can undermine feelings of safety and security and the desire to use local parks. And so this big complicated problem, like I don't pretend like I have this silver bullet solution, but rather I really want to invite us to think through multiple perspectives and how unhoused people living in parks can affect overall park access. And then we can talk about compassionate and practical ways to address that. And so we're gonna look at like the facts, um, address public camping laws, discuss using person first language, and then identify really proactive approaches to reduce harm and um, increase public education. Okay, I see some chat. Um, so Oregon does have a disproportionately large population of individuals experiencing homelessness, and that's in comparison to the rest of the country. And so it's due to another number of factors like inadequate housing supply, increased housing costs, um, a persistent population of unhoused people who require really specialized housing and social services. And there's whole reports about this. Um, but a 2019 report uh, commissioned by the Oregon Community Health Foundation, it showed that while states, uh, the state's total population represented 1.3% of the total U.S. population, uh, the population of unhoused people in Oregon represented 2.6% of the U.S. population, of the U.S. unhoused population. And so the report also found that homelessness disproportionately impacted Black, Indigenous, people of color um, in those communities in Oregon, and that disparity does mirror national data. So camping in parks on public property is prohibited in many of Oregon's cities and counties. And in addition, state law requires that local jurisdictions develop really humane policies for the removal of camps from public property. And so it requires things like written 24-hour notice and 
storage of personal items. But homelessness is not against the law. And so the Ninth Circuit Court has ruled that cities cannot clear unhoused people from parks and public spaces if there are more unhoused people than available shelter beds. So, in, so there's like some rules around this and it really does depend on the community. But in general, when we're talking about unhoused individuals, it's super important to approach the complexities and just like, I think it's just the situation of camping and resting in public spaces and thinking about this in a solution driven way and from a compassionate place. The way that we talk about things really does influence our perception of them. And so I think as actually transportation professionals, as public health folks, we can think about this and model this in a solution oriented way and um, be really deliberate about how we communicate. So tips for talking about unhoused populations. So emphasize personhood over status. Um, use terms like unhoused people or unsheltered individuals. So like you wouldn't say like that person's diabetic. You'd say like they have been diagnosed with diabetes or um, Be Becky shared one that was um, like you wouldn't call somebody a juvenile delinquent. You would say like they've been impacted by the justice system. So that's just like a way of like preserving dignity and putting the person before their particular situation. Um, additionally, identifying specific issues like litter um, and like saying like we need to address the litter rather than to act as if um, a person is unwanted or unde undesirable. So yeah, as we're like talking about this, I think, you know, like we want to preserve safety and quality of parks, but we also want to preserve the dignity of park users um, and find alternative to, I don't know, like to sweeps and, uh, and finding ways to produce harm reducing services and foster connections between people and community. And the thing about sweeps, they're, they're like pretty devastating for folks who are living outside because they get removed from where they're staying. Um, they can lose access to their personal belongings and they're actually really costly. Uh, a 2019 audit of the city of Portland uh, showed that the cleaning efforts uh, from the city cost, it cost the city 3.6 million a year. And so instead of costly sweeps and forceful removal, we consider al alternatives like connecting people with services and promoting safe park usage by all community members. One example of this is in Modesto, California, where they actually allocated a specific park area for camping. And so people could congregate and sleep there without penalty. And they found that like they equipped it with portable restrooms and hand washing stations and dumpsters for trash. And it was a short term solution but they did see an immediate improvement in other park facilities. And so in the meantime, they were able to enforce no sleeping rules in other public spaces. And um, they partnered with county and faith-based organizations and homelessness advocates to prepare um, another emergency shelter, which is gonna be more suitable for helping individuals on the path to housing security. So that's in Modesto, California. These are in Eugene, Oregon. Uh, the city partners with a local community-based organization to offer coordinated mental health response services, um, as well as these designated rest areas. So there's an organization called Cahoots, which is crisis assistance helping out on the streets. It's a community-based public safety system to provide mental health first response to those in need. And it's a really effective non-policing strategy for working with individuals experiencing um, crises in mental health. And uh, yeah, so these are really great options as well. And additionally, you can create safer spaces just by designing them a little bit differently. This is a um, photo of Youngstown, Ohio, where they had this like old tennis court that was attracting a lot of illegal activity at night. And it, it, was, it was kind of um, secluded from the rest of the park and it was dark. And so they used grant funding to pull up the blacktop, reseed it, put some like a fence up, but like a pleasant one, you know, so cars couldn't drive up on it. Um, and this was actually along the path to a school. And so like this was also a safe path to school um, concern as well. And so 
the community interest in this and like the work that went into this caught the eye of the councilwoman for that area. And so she ended up finding $10,000 in the budget to donate to this project and um, repair a broken sidewalk leading to the park as well. And so uh, another issue, um, unhoused individuals are at really high risk for substance addiction. And that's because it's a contributor to, it's a contributor to living unhoused and a byproduct of living unhoused as well. Um, in 2019, nearly half of the people living unsheltered in Portland uh, they reported living with substance abuse issues, either alcohol or drugs, and one in four people sleeping outside reported having both mental illness and substance use disorders. Um, while Parks and Rec folks and like park access folks and like transportation folks, like, we don't go into this necessarily looking to tackle homelessness and substance abuse, but we can really contribute to short-term and long-term solutions. And so maybe that's equipping park and rec staff with overdose reducing drugs or offering training to help folks deepen the understanding of homelessness and substance abuse. And then there's upstream approaches, like offering pain, demand, pain management classes, like Tai Chi or Walk With Ease, spending time in nature and helping to just reduce the toxic stress and find community connection. Additionally, we need to partner with folks who know how to handle this stuff. So public health, treatment providers, and unhoused advocacy organizations, they're critical to meeting the needs of folks who are living outside. And they can help provide health services and connect people to housing and treatment solutions. Um, another resource to look at is the Oregon Health Authority's um, list of harm reduction facilities, as well as ideas for um, needle exchange or otherwise known as syringe service programs. And they're really important. It's a really important part of a public health response that kind of curbs outbreaks of overdose and infectious diseases. So here are some like kind of basic ideas for balancing the frustrations of housed folks who are trying to use these beautiful spaces and then the hardship of just having nowhere to go. You're facing like when you are unhoused, you have you don't have a place to be. And so it isn't easy. And here are some ideas. So educating the public, like finding ways to just frame this in a way that people are understanding of what's going on. And NRPA, the National Recreation and Parks Association, has really good ideas for this. Um, activating the space through family-oriented activities and making sure that there's just regular activity in the space, activating it, building community ownership of the space, and then partnering with local community or faith-based organizations to do food distribution and making sure that there's like the proper things to go along with that. And so deepening that collective understanding um, and understanding the barriers, we can hopefully become a much more inclusive and accessible place for all people. Um, and that's the goal, right? So I know we have about four minutes left, but I'd love to hear from you guys. Do you have questions? Um, are there any ideas that particularly interest you or um, barriers or opportunities that you see specifically in your community around this? And also to end this, I'm going to leave my contact info up there. But yeah, we're here for a few more minutes if you want to share. And thanks, Becky, for dropping that. There's so much more in there. Like, I was able to just skim the surface of what's encased in that toolkit resource. Um, and I do see a question from Colin. Um, how does the partnership work with ODOT's Safe Routes program? 
Colin, can you clarify when you say partnership, are you referring to our organization, the Safe Routes Partnership, or are you wondering how to partner? Oh, yes, okay. Um, well, we have uh, local staff in Oregon, myself and uh, Kari Schlosshauer is our senior policy manager in Portland. So we've partnered um, with ODOT, um, ODOT Safe Routes to School program on a number of things. And actually Kari is a part of the Safe Routes to School Advisory Committee. Um, but our organization is nationally based um, and nationally focused. So we work with lots of different states and local communities. Um, but if you're looking for ideas on how to connect with ODOT Safe Routes to School program, I know there are probably lots of folks in this, in this breakout room um, and at this uh, uh, summit that can connect you with folks. Yeah, folks, I really appreciate you being here today. Um, I realize we're at the end of our time. And really, if I can just emphasize, please do reach out if you have any questions. Um, and the link to the toolkit is in the chat box. And we're so excited for you to look at it and ask us questions. And have a great rest of your day and enjoy the rest of the session that you're going to. Um, yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Natasha and Becky. Thank you to our sponsors who are listed on the Sketch conference website. And thank you, attendees, for coming. Please do enjoy the rest of the summit.